Um, <clears throat> so like Gary said, uh, my name is Tom Schmelk. I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service. Um, and I'm the program lead on Brown Tail. Um, so as you may well know, uh, Brown Tail moth has continued to expand its range um, further inland and, and further north in Maine uh, this year. And the most heavily impacted counties uh, are Androscoggin, and Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo. Um, also some of the most populated counties. Uh, so we did receive uh, a very, very high call volume this year, uh, well over 500 calls um, by just the Maine Forest Service, um, in addition to some of our other state cooperators like CDC um, and Extension and 211. Uh, so, if you some of some of you do know this, but we do two rounds of aerial survey each year. Um, one survey is in the late spring, early summer to pick up the actual defoliation from the uh, mature caterpillars, and then we fly another round of aerial survey in the late summer, early fall to pick up the skeletonization damage from the young caterpillars. So these are just some uh, basically uh, acres defoliated. Per county, as you can see, the grand total at the bottom here is uh, right around 200,000 acres. So this is uh, quite the increase, even from uh, last year, where we had around 156,000 acres of defoliation, and it sort of um, speaks to the volume of uh, brown tail's presence in Maine um, in the in the current year. Uh, this is a uh, a photo from a couple of years ago, but um, it's still sort of what we're seeing. Uh, this area in the middle of the screen here with this uh, sort of light brown color, that's those are stands of oak trees that have been defoliated. And, and this is uh, out, out sort of by the Camden Hills area. Um, and this damage sort of extended, you know, pretty far up. Uh, same was true for this year, um, although there were, were certainly new towns and, and new areas that were uh, experiencing heavy defoliation. Uh, so in addition to uh, those two aerial surveys for defoliation that I talked about, uh, there is an, uh, an annual winter web survey. That survey typically begins uh, towards the end of December or early January. And in that survey, uh, our technicians basically drive the roads, the, all the major roads throughout the infested area, as well as some buffer to capture any range expansion or satellite populations. Um, and basically, we drop data points uh, for given stretches of road, estimating the number of webs per tree. So um, each of these colored data points here, obviously, the hotter the color, the more webs per tree that we were finding. Um, so each of these data points uh, is associated with GPS coordinates, uh, host tree type, and uh, the number of, of webs, as well as the uh, um, the the pattern of webs. So continuous, patchy, or or single. If it's in a uh, single tree in somebody's yard. Uh, so one thing of note here. Um, so this area circled uh, up in Arusta County. Um, that was uh, so. This past winter, uh, our Technicians picked up two satellite, or three, actually three satellite populations. I forgot to put the third one in here, um, but three satellite populations uh, up in the county of of just a single web uh, each, and that sort of speaks to the to the volume of how well brown tail can uh, spread and and um, hitchhike rides. So this area that's circled here in red, that's where the main bulk of the population of brown tail is. So you can see, uh, you know, quite it's it's spread quite the distance. Again, these are just single single web detections, but um, you know, it's brown tail is, is very very good at hitchhiking. Do not underestimate it. Uh, so some good news and some bad news on the brown tail pathogen front. Um, so, as you know, this is sort of the third year of drought that we've had uh, in Maine, and that definitely affects uh, the the pathogens surrounding brown tail. 
Uh, so when it's, it's hot and dry, it's not very good for the spread and proliferation of the fungus and the virus that attack brown tail. Um, but even though it, it was hot and dry, we did detect some isolated pockets of these pathogens. Um, so this photo shows uh, an apple tree in Belfast, a single apple tree uh, that was completely denuded, but also uh, experienced a 100% mortality um, due to the fungus, and, and there was some virus present at the site as well, um, which is good news because uh, even though it's it didn't get to spread, um, you know, far and wide, it it is present, and we another. Um, sort of silver lining to this that we uh, discovered this year is that the both the fungus and the virus are very widespread in Maine. Um, pretty much, pretty much everywhere you find brown tail in Maine, there are very small isolated pockets of these pathogens. Um, it, I was very surprised, so I went on a site visit up in Blue Hill, and I was very surprised to see the fungus um, and the virus already there. Um, so very widespread, Blue Hill, uh, down where I live in Dresden, we saw some of the virus. Um, but unfortunately, in order for to have a huge population collapse and to have these pathogens spread and sort of rip through the population, uh, we will need a, a basically a normal spring, a, a wet um, a wet May and June in particular, um, will help help these pathogens bring down brown tail. Um, unfortunately, at, at the scale it is right now, it, it might possibly take a couple of years of this wet, you know, normal spring weather to to really crash the population. So fingers and toes crossed for this spring. Um, this was over at my house, and as you can see, with uh, a lot of these pathogens, um, they were kind of delayed. So a lot of the caterpillars were already starting to pupate. Um, by the time most of them experienced mortality. So um, most of the damage to the trees was done. Um, this caterpillar that's hanging here um, is most likely uh, killed by the virus. Uh, so we also saw some uh, very late season uh, pathogen activity. So in September, um, as I was doing some of the checkups for uh, these weekly to uh, weekly monitoring updates that we were posting on the website every week. Um, I did find some some mortality of the very young caterpillars as they were building their their winter web, or as it was nearly complete. Um, they sort of just melted um, melted into the web here. Um, so it's good news. It was a little bit widespread, at least here on campus in Augusta. Um, there were multiple trees with um, these deceased caterpillars hanging out. Um, and also, uh, we can't forget about the parasitoids. Um, so, also in in monitoring, uh, doing those developmental uh, monitoring updates, uh, I did uh, see some ticketed flies um, sort of poking around these winter webs. And for those of you who don't know, so ticketidae are a group of exclusively uh, parasitoid flies, very very large family, um, and they all. Um, they all rely on other insects or arthropods to complete their life cycle, um, and and many do use brown tail. Um, Carla Boyd up at UMaine um, did a lot of her um, thesis work on the parasitoids of brown tail in Maine. So some good news. Um, so we do have some new and sharpened tools uh, to to basically disseminate in information to the public. Um, we recently completely revised the Frequently Asked Questions page, uh, basically uh, reformatted some of it, but most importantly, we added many questions um, involving inject uh, tree injections, uh, um, but then also animal health. Uh, so well, uh, probably a little over half of the people that were calling this spring and summer were, um, were asking about the tree injections. So we decided to um, to collaborate with uh, BP uh, Board Pesticide Control and CDC um, and the state vet to to get some of these questions added and updated. Uh, we also uh, created a brown tail moth dashboard. Um, this is an interactive uh, sort. It, it's a basically an interactive map 
um, that uses the the data from our aerial surveys and also the data from the winter web surveys. Um, and you can zoom in and, and look at what's going on in your town. Uh, we decided to move away from the traditional uh, round tail moth risk map that we had um, for the past, you know, previous previous years in order to um, sort of focus in on on just the raw data and what's going on um, in, in the, each of those towns. Uh, there's a link to it here, but it's also available right on our brown tail moth uh, main forest service page. Um, it's under survey and, and management. Um, also, probably most importantly for this call, um, we are some revisions to the main municipal battle book for brown tail moth are nearing completion. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is a uh, basically a toolbox for municipalities um, to guide them in their uh, fight against brown tail moth. Um, some of the things that it includes are some of the uh, regulations. Um, there is a sort of a work plan, a schedule um, throughout the year about, you know, what should be done, what time of the year, and it sort of um, walks you through that whole process. Um, everything from scouting out where the winter webs are uh, to lining up treatment or, um, you know, sort of guiding in that decision. Uh, and that will be available soon. In fact, right after this call, um, I'm going to com continue working on that uh, so that it's available. OK, so now we're going to get into the management uh, side of things. So probably the most important thing is the first step to management is always education. Um, educating the public. So even though we at the Maine Forest Service has, have done no shortage of outreach and um, uh, <laughs> interviews and uh, you know newspaper articles and press releases, unfortunately uh, we are not able to reach everybody. And a very good percentage, I would say about uh, 30 or 40 percent of the people that were calling me this uh, past spring and summer would start off by the conversation by saying, you know, my apple tree in my front yard or my crab apple tree in my front yard. Um, and for the most part, these those trees, those fruit trees or ornamentals are the easiest to flip webs out. Um, and they could have saved themselves uh, a whole lot of trouble and headache and rashes um, if they had been able to clip out those webs. Um, so we're setting up brown, uh, we're setting up February to be uh, Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month um, in hopes of increasing uh, public participation and uh, just getting the word out about brown tail. A lot of these communities that are experiencing brown tail for the first time, um, they typically think of brown tail as uh, just a coastal issue and they're taken by surprise when it shows up in their yard, even though uh, we have been warning for, for many years now. Um, some of the different ways to get the community involved. Um, it, so community education, uh, I have given countless talks to the town and municipalities, these informational sessions um, to sort of get the word out. Uh, service projects, so um, town-wide surveys or town-wide web clippings um, or town-wide celebrations that involve uh, you know, community web clipping and a, a bonfire at the end um, and neighborhood contests. Everybody loves a good competition, um, you know, pitting neighborhoods or even towns against each other to see who can, um, you know, clip the most webs. Uh, so the reason why February, uh, we picked February to be Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month um, because February and the winter in general is a, a very, very good time for um, looking for those webs because you can see them. Most of the leaves are off the trees. Uh, and if you're surveying on a nice bright sunny day with the sun to your back, those webs really um, pop out and they they shine and you can um, you can pick them out over uh, leaves that are are still hanging on the trees. Um, it also gives time to individuals um, and homeowners and towns to um, to figure out where the, the webs are, where the most webs are and to plan and inform their management decisions. Um, and this web clipping or these web clipping events are ideally completed by uh, early April. Um, so some of the other 
uh, some of the other actions that towns can take um, is for towns or, or city websites that have a, a brown-tail moth presence. Um, many towns basically link to our uh, our own main forest service website and our online resources there um, which is always good um, social media reminders at, at key times during the year will help get the word out and inform uh, your citizens and your constituents to um, get out there and be proactive um, signage warning of infestations uh, i have it a little bit later in my presentation um, but the city of Portland has done a, a really excellent job with um, with disseminating to the public, you know, the risks of brown tail uh, with these um, with these signs. Uh, and then there's also referral to 211 for more information. Um, 211 has been trained uh, on our frequently asked questions, um, and they are a very very good resource. We appreciate them a lot. Oh, I should mention. So this was a web clipping event, uh, annual web clipping event um, that happens on Deer Isle. It's actually multiple events throughout the winter. Um, and they usually go up for one or two of those events. And um, Deer, uh, the town of Deer Isle and Little, Little Deer Isle uh, have done a really excellent job with community engagement, uh, especially the the land trusts up there, um, getting the word out and and um, you know making it into a fun activity, um, cutting cutting these areas into pieces, you know, to to go through and um, get almost all the webs um, and, and really help out up there. Um, so this is what the, the webs will look like on a nice, bright, sunny day. You know, know where your enemy is, know where the hot spots in your town are or even in your own dooryard, and that will help inform your management decisions um, during the winter or the, the following spring. Okay, so there's three uh, three categories of management, um, and each town or municipality uh, will have a mix of these. It's not, uh, you know, one uh, one size fits all. Uh, so the first category of management is to do nothing, um, and of course that saves money. Um, but if, depending on uh, the situation in each town, uh, there may be significant quality of life impacts um, as well as other potential impacts. Um, some being economic. Um, so one of the other things is uh, if you do choose to do nothing, you might need to provide information uh, about the presence of brown tail in really highly infested areas. Uh, and this is what I was talking about um, before uh, with the city of Portland um, having these posters um, posted in Deering Oaks Park and, and other potential risk sites. Um, and then you also might need to consider shutting some areas off um, during peak caterpillar activity. Um, I know this happens at Wolf's Neck State Park and some of the other state parks um, in that area is they have to close off um, close off sections of the park um, to prevent people from coming into contact with these hares. Um, the other one of the other uh, categories of treatment is mechanical um, and. Like we were saying, web clipping is best done when the trees are dormant um, because you can see all the, it's less harm to the tree and you can see where all the webs are very clearly. Risk of uh, hair activity is very low. Um, and this clipping should be, like I mentioned before, this clipping should be done before mid-April and you're gonna wanna destroy the webs once you clip them out. If these clipped webs just land on the ground, um, the caterpillars are very good at finding food and will climb uh, right back up on the tree in the spring. Uh, so this mechanical clipping is not practical for all trees, especially in, in most areas of, uh, especially coastal Maine, have large mature oak trees that are very high, um, but arborists can sometimes treat uh, and clip out these webs from trees that are out of the reach of um, homeowners and municipalities. Um, so in the city of Bath, um, when Kyle Rosenberg was the uh, city arborist, um, they did have a bucket truck and would go around and, and clip um, a lot of these webs along the streets. And that um, was really, really a great help. Um, inside each of these palm sized webs is between 25 and 400 caterpillars. So um, every single one that you can get, um, whether by hand or a bucket truck, uh, will help. 
so one of the other categories is insecticides. Um, there's a few, obviously a few different application methods. Uh, so you have aerial application, uh, which is the best option for uh, very wide control, um, but it's difficult to get buy-in from the public. Um, a lot of people are hesitant to, to be spraying stuff from an airplane. Uh, even if you were just spraying water, um, people, a lot of people would not be um, okay with that. Um, so, so getting that buy-in from the public is is sometimes difficult. Um, it's not practical for individual ownerships, uh, just because of the the nature of the beast. You're spraying from an airplane, very uh, very difficult to hit. You know these small targets uh, of individual houses or uh, very small individual woodlots. Um, also, individuals can opt out of. Uh, opt out of the spray program, uh, which means you get this sort of Swiss cheese hole pattern. Um, and when the when the spray pattern is um, patchy, uh, it's it's pretty, pretty ineffective. So when people opt out, you have to leave their property and then you also have to leave a buffer um, on the edge of their property, uh, which cont contributes to that Swiss cheese pattern. Um, yeah, okay. And then for the because of the potential use of more targeted pro uh, products like BTK, um, or if we we're ever able to get the fungus or the virus um, weaponized, um, you and with these aerial surveys when, or aerial sprays, when you eliminate you know individuals treating their own properties, um, it, it's often better ecologically. Um, a lot of the ground rates. Um, have a, a higher rate of application, so you're using more product um, compared to aerial. Um, but there, there are many other hurdles to uh, to these aerial applications. Uh, so then you have foliar ground applications, um, and Jeff Tarling uh, will talk about this uh, in a little bit. Um, but they treated Deering Oaks Park, um, and they had Whitney Tree come in with this uh, mist blower. Um, some of the drawbacks to foliar ground applications is you do need an adequate leaf surface to spray on, um, which is sometimes not until you know the third week of May or towards the end of May, depending on the, the year and the weather. Um, but you need that leaf surface in order to be able to spray on. Um, it can also be difficult to get public buy-in. Um, I know when the the spraying of Deering Oaks was proposed, there was a lot of uh, Maybe not a lot, but there was definitely some public outcry. Um, but eventually, um, they were able to get it done. Um, so, just in general, with woodlots and and trees that are sort of away from people's houses, um, it, they can be limited in in uh, woodlots or, or forest stands. Um, but so one of the the biggest things that I got this year. A lot of people would call me after they called the tree company and um, because their oak had no leaves on it and they thought it was automatically dead and they had the tree company come and cut them down. Um, and I wish they had spoken to me first because those trees um, were going to leaf out if they hadn't succumbed um, to brown tail, they would leaf out again um, in, in July after the feeding had been done. Um, oaks and Trees in general, but oaks in particular, are very tolerant of defoliation and can survive multiple years of being completely defoliated. Um, although this is compounded by um, different uh, different mm -hmm. things in Maine, so there are other insects, other invasive insects that feed on oak, uh, like Limancheri dispar, formerly known as gypsy moth, um, and winter moth. When you get um, multiple species defoliating a tree um, in a given season, it can really take a toll. Um, and also the drought that we've been experiencing in, in Maine for the past few years um, has really stressed the trees out a little bit more than normal. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, uh, about half or over half of the people that called this year were asking about tree injections. Um, there are some benefits and there are some drawbacks. Um, it is more targeted than uh, broadcast spraying, uh, but it can be very, the, 
the uh, materials are expensive and the cost can be prohibitive at a larger scale, um, but it is very useful for um, sensitive areas near water um, or specimen trees or trees that are in heavily used areas. Like if you have trees overhanging your house or your deck or a driveway, um, it, it can be um, it can be beneficial that way. Um, we there has been, <laughs> there can be some user error um, if people do not follow the directions um, at, on the label. Um, but but generally um, people put it together and, and it's able to work for them. Um, I should also note with a lot of these chemical options, most of these chemical treatments are focused on mitigating people coming into contact with the hairs or reducing the populations um, of brown tail so that they don't come into contact with the hairs. It's not necessarily um, focused on tree health, which is why if when homeowners uh, call me and they, like most homeowners, are on a fixed budget, um, if, and you you can only afford to treat certain trees, focus on the ones that are right next to the house, overhanging the house. Um, don't worry too much about the woodlot next door. Um, it it will will be fine in in all likelihood. Um, but yeah, if if money is tight, you know, focus on the trees and heavily heavily trafficked areas. Uh, so one one thing, uh, so tree removal is kind of a a last resort last option. Um, I always say it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Brown tail moth will not always be this bad. And hopefully, you know, your oak tree that has a lifespan of a couple of hundred years and will hopefully be here um, long after this outbreak uh, has ended. Um, you know, you got to look at the long, long view value of the tree, the shade it provides, the habitat, the food for wildlife, um, stuff like that. Um, but if uh, it is a good option if the tree is, you know, in, a, in the wrong place, uh, too close to the house or um, under power lines, um, poor form in, in declining health, or um, you don't value the tree, um, it, it can be a one and done option. And we typically ask people to, um, if they can wait until the winter um, to cut these trees down um, to do that, because you'll be able to um, You'll basically be able to to clip the webs out on that fallen um, fallen tree, and sort of have you know kill two birds with one stone. Um, also, the ground is frozen in the winter, or it's supposed to be frozen in the winter, um, so the heavy equipment needed to take down some of these trees will have less of an impact. Um, as a side note. Okay, so another really important point that many people forget um, is to know your licensing requirements. Um, so the main board of pesticide control, uh, their motto is think first, spray last, which is, is very good advice. Um, so I have links here to licensing and certification, uh, pesticide laws, regulations and policies, um, and there is special special requirements for treatment of schools and other public areas. Um, there are there are many chapters. Uh, I just highlighted these two in particular. Um, chapter 27 is standards for pesticide application uh, and public notification in schools. Um, and then chapter 28 is the notification for provisions for outside pesticide applications. Um, I see Allison put the uh, put the main board pesticide uh, website in the chat. Definitely check that out. A lot of great resources. Um, and then also, uh, very importantly, is do not use unlicensed individuals to perform uh, do-it-yourself treatments. Um, and then you're also going to want to make sure that if you do uh, whatever pesticide uh, you plan on applicating, if you uh, if you do go decide to go that route, is basically to double check to make sure that pesticide is registered in Maine. Uh, and you can do that on the BPC website there. 